Thank you, Greg and uh, Bob, and it's a pleasure to be here. It's, uh, I've had a, the pleasure of a long uh, collaboration with uh, people at NHGRI. We recently actually have instituted a combined fellowship program in genetics with uh, the intramural program at NHGRI. And uh, of course now um, Suburban and Johns Hopkins have uh, joined together, so we have uh, lots to celebrate and to look forward to in ter terms of continued uh, interactions. Uh, and um, so I'm pleased to be here to have a chance to talk to you about my favorite subject. Uh, I, I'm also pleased to be the lead-off speaker in this uh, series, which uh, Greg and Bob have put together, which looks quite good. And so. Um, uh, I hope to sort of set the stage for many of the people that come later. Uh, please interrupt me if I'm uh, uh, not making myself clear or if you want clarification on some point or if I'm talking about stuff that's old hat, uh, tell me to move ahead and, and uh, not uh, spend time on it. So uh, I'd, like, I'd love to make this as informal and as interactive as possible. So uh, what I would like to talk about is the human genome and uh, in what I call individualized medicine. And <clears throat> so we could start off by saying what is individualized medicine? I'm going to put this out of the way. And uh, so I, I turn to uh, Francis uh, for guidance here, Francis Collins. And uh, Francis said uh, back in 2005 that at its most basic, personalized medicine refers to using information about a person's genetic makeup to tailor strategies for the detection, treatment, or prevention of disease. And I think that uh, sums it up quite well. The only place that I disagree with Francis is that I much prefer the term individualized as opposed to personalized, and I'm going to take the prerogative here uh, since I have the podium to tell you why. So um, personal, if you look in the dictionary, has two meanings, really. It has uh, relating to someone's private life, uh, a sense of intimacy, and the other is relating to one person, a particular individual. Now, medicine has always been personal. As physicians, we uh, are allowed to ask people questions that no one else asks them. We are allowed to examine them in ways that no one else examines them. So medicine has always been personal, in my view. But it has not been individualized. And so that's what we're looking at, a, a, a way to consider each person as an individual and to adjust our thinking about the patient uh, to uh, account for their individual strengths and weaknesses. So for that reason and for others, which I won't go into, uh, I urge you to consider thinking of this as individualized medicine. Now, why would we consider <clears throat> the topic of individualized medicine now? Why is it so much in the press and in the news and so forth? And uh, it's particularly worth asking because uh, modern medicine really has had enormous successes. So we've had a dramatic prolongation of the lifestyle, of the lifespan, and uh, a, dr a dramatic improved quality of life. So medicine <coughs> has been doing a good job. On the other hand, uh, there are ongoing concerns. Uh, many diseases have an increasing incidence. Uh, there's an unacceptable frequency of adverse events, uh, adverse therapeutic events. Uh, we all hear daily about the cost of medicine continuing to go up. And if you talk to patients, and, and uh, all of you do all the time, uh, they usually say they want two things from their physician. They want a physician who's smart, has good knowledge, but they also want a physician who cares about them as an individual, as a person. So I think we have an opportunity to move medicine from a very successful level to a new plateau. And I think the way we will do that is by individualizing uh, medical care. Uh, and uh, so to put it in a different way, I like to think about a particular disease. And the one I would mention is type 2 diabetes. As you know, its incidence is increasing throughout the industrialized world. And it's intertwined with the increasing incidence of obesity. And it's a chronic illness with an array of complications, microvascular complications and macrovascular complications. Um, but suppose a member of your family or, or a, a friend of yours, a close friend of yours, has type 2 diabetes. Would you like to know the prognosis and response to existing treatments for the average patient with type 2 diabetes? Uh, 
Or would you like to know as precisely as possible the specific features, prognosis, and response to therapy for your loved one or your close acquaintance? So, or even better, could we imagine knowing ahead of time who is at high risk for type 2 diabetes and actually prevent the illness from ever occurring? So uh, that's the goal here, is to try to uh, identify the individual strengths and weaknesses of our patients and as much as possible prevent them from ever getting sick. But if they do get sick, then to individualize our counseling and our treatment and uh, it, to optimize it as quickly as possible. So <clears throat> in that regard, I sort of think there are two characteristics of modern medicine, current medicine. So the first is that in medical school, and currently I think we have been trained to uh, to perform what I call an average medicine. Now by average, I don't mean pejor in the pejorative sense that it's mediocre. I mean that we think about, uh, when we make a diagnosis, we think about what is appropriate for the average patient with that diagnosis. Uh, and part of that comes from the way we're trained, and I call that uh, aspect of our training the classic case mentality. So this is the little boy on the left is a patient that I saw and his sister, and they both have a, a uh, genetic syndrome that's characterized by some abnormal physical findings. And in the days gone by, what would happen is the family would come to the clinic. We would take a family history and a history of the present illness, a physical exam, some x-rays, some routine laboratory tests. And then whoever had seen the patient would get together and say, well, I think it's a case of this or I think it's a case of that. And usually what would happen, at least at Hopkins, would be the person with the most gray hair or the least hair uh, would uh, finally make a pronouncement that I think this is a case of whatever. And then our thinking would become constrained. We would start thinking of the patient as an example of a particular disease rather than thinking of the patient as an individual who happens to have this set of problems. And at the time, in terms of the tools that we had available, that was, that was the way we had to practice medicine. Now the other aspect of uh, medicine, medical practice in the 20th century is what I call uh, trial and error medicine. That is to say that, uh, as you all know, what we do is we see a patient, we make a diagnosis, we think about what kind of interventions we would like to make, we make some baseline measurements, we make the intervention, then we follow the patient, repeat the baseline measurements, and ask with our intervention, has the patient, is the patient doing better, is it staying the same, or is in fact worse? If they're staying the same or worse, then perhaps we'll change that intervention and alter it and do something else. So this is sort of a, a trial and error kind of medicine. So the goal in the future would be to be able to predict uh, with a fair degree of accuracy what would be the best treatment for this patient without having to go through this uh, trial and error uh, uh, sort of set of protocols. So uh, thinking about the patient and as an individual. And so uh, I think the more experienced physicians have, they come to learn, despite the fact that in med medical school, classically, you were sort of taught like, this is what happens with a case of this, this is what happens with a case of that. As you get more and more experience, you begin to realize that no two patients, uh, even those patients with the same diagnoses, uh, behave exactly alike in terms of their complications, their response to tra treatment, and so forth. So that's a lesson that we tend to learn by uh, experience in the trenches. And this point was actually uh, emphasized <coughs> by Oswe Temkin, who is a professor of the history of medicine at Hopkins, now deceased, but he said, there is no science of the individual, and medicine suffers from a fundamental contradiction. Its practice deals with the individual. In other words, the person that comes to see us is an individual, while its theory, what we learned in medical school, grasps universals only. So you're sort of left uh, in, in days gone by to um, individualize your approaches and your thinking uh, after you get out of medical school. And this idea is not new, actually. A colleague of mine pointed this out to me, that back in 350 BC, none other than Aristotle said, the doctor does not treat man except accidentally. He treats Callias or Socrates or somebody else. So if someone knows the universal without knowing the individuals contained in it, he will often fail in his treatment, for it is the individual who has to be treated. So it's a, not a new idea. 
So what I keep reminding our students and what I think we have to think about is that when we see a large number of patients, I'm a pediatrician, um, so this is where I start seeing my patients, we just have to remind ourselves that each of these individuals has his or her own unique sampling of our species genetic endowment. Each has a unique history of in utero development, and each is born into a family with a unique constellation of socioeconomic variables. So all of those factors, the ge genetic makeup, the early development, and the social cultural milieu for each patient individualizes them and has an influence on what diseases they are at risk for and how they will respond to our attempts to uh, treat or pre prevent or treat those diseases. So this is all well and good, but you could ask, what has changed? <coughs> what makes it possible to contemplate moving medicine from its current successful level to an even more successful level as we go forward? So I would submit, and I'm, I'm a geneticist, so I, I would submit that the major driver for this is, has been the Human Genome Project and what we've learned about the genetic makeup of uh, members of our species. So. Uh, the Human Genome Project sequencing technology and the appreciation of sequence variation, uh, what's come to be called whole genome sequence biology, an, an increasing prominence of evolutionary thinking in medicine, <coughs> a, a progress in disease gene identification, and uh, sort of what has been, in my view, a watershed, the, the ability to obtain uh, individual genome sequences on individual patients. So I'm going to talk about each of these bullet points uh, briefly. So first of all, let's turn to the Human Genome Project and sequencing technology and genetic variation. So you all know that <coughs> the Genome Project really was contemplated in the mid-80s, and there was a good bit of argument initially about whether or not it was a good idea and a, a useful way to spend uh, research dollars. Uh, but eventually, uh, the argument carried the day, and the Genome Project got started officially on October 1st, 1990, under the direction of Jim Watson uh, across the street. Uh, uh, Francis took over in 1993, Francis Collins, and initially it focused on technology and model organisms, yeast and C. elegans and flies and so forth. But in the mid-90s, it turned its attention almost completely to the human genome, and in fact, it was a a uh, competition between the so-called public group headed up by Francis and the private group headed up by Craig Venter. And miraculously, uh, both groups finished on the same day as shown here in this uh, front page of the New York Times. This is Tuesday, June uh, 27, 2000, when both groups announced the uh, fact that they had a draft sequence of the human genome. The public group went on to uh, do a uh, 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 more than a draft to do a, a very high a quality complete sequence of the human genome and that was finished in about 2003. So uh, let me just make sure we're all on the same page <coughs> with terms. Is there a, I forgot to bring a pointer, is there a pointer here? <laughs> so uh, I just want to, since it's been a, a while since some of you may have thought about this, uh, what I've uh, shown here is a diagram of a gene. So amazingly, the word gene was uh, coined in about 1908 by a man by the name of Johansson. And uh, if you look at how genetics, geneticists have defined uh, what a gene is over the time since then, the definition keeps changing. And in fact, if you put 10 geneticists in a room right now and ask them for a definition of a gene, you might get 12 uh, definitions. So let me tell you sort of, so we're more or less all on the same page what most of us mean. So what I've defined, uh, shown on this diagram is a mammalian gene, a gene that encodes a protein. And it turns out the pieces of the gene that actually account for the coding sequence are called exons. They're the pieces that, uh, thanks Greg, that are um, retained. So here are the exons. This is a four exon gene. Those are the pieces of the gene that are when transcribed into RNA and then there's uh, splicing that goes on. These four segments, the RNA corresponding to these four segments ends up in the mature mRNA that goes out into the cytosol. And then there are pieces of DNA between the exons and we call those introns. And when they're transcribed, the, gene, the transcription of the gene to RNA would start right here. It would go like this and then these intronic pieces would be spliced out and the mature message would be made up of 
a sequence that corresponds to exon 1, 2, 3, and 4 all stitched together. So these are the exons. These, uh, blue, the purple line is the introns. And up in the front of the gene, the 5' end, there's some regulatory sequences. We call that the promoter. There might be some distant regulatory sequences way away uh, that we call enhancers. And uh, the translation would start here once the RNA was made. And uh, all of these would give information about making the protein that corresponds to the product of this gene. And then this would be the 3' UTR untranslated region of the message. So this is what is a classic protein coding gene. Now we now know that there's other genes in the genome that encode RNA, but the RNA is never uh, translated into protein. So there's a set of RNA genes as well as protein genes. For most geneticists and for what I'm going to tell you today, when I say gene, I mean genes that encode protein, like this one here. So if we look at where we stood in 2003 in terms of understanding the human genome, there's some simple uh, features that I just want to remind you of. First of all, if we counted up the number of genes in the genome, it turns out there are about 22,000 genes in the human genome. Now this is a big surprise to everybody. Uh, we had a pool about how many genes it would take to make a human. And of course, because we're egocentric, we all, most of us guessed way high. I guessed 100,000 genes. Uh, and it turns out that if you look at all organisms that have bilateral symmetry from flatworms to butterflies to fruit flies, uh, it's about 20,000 genes. So for some reason, we don't know why, this is sort of the sweet spot for genes in the biological kingdom. Uh, we know right now of about the function of human genes of about 75% of these 22,000. So there's a, still a good number of genes in the genome that we don't even have a clue as to what their function is. Uh, those exons, those pieces of genes that actually get spliced and retained in the messenger RNA and go out in the cytosol and are used to direct the synthesis of proteins, we can actually count them up now because we've got the sequence of the whole genome. And there are about 220,000 exons in the genome. And those exons are distributed over about 50 megabases. The entire uh, genome is about 3,000 megabases or 3 gigabases. And over here is a comparison to the mouse. And there's actually pretty good similarity between the mouse and the human genome. So 22,000 genes, about 220,000 exons. And the exome, which we, what we've come to call that portion of the genome that uh, comprises all of the exons, is about 50 megabases. That's only about 1.5% of the total genome. So there's a lot of the genome that doesn't seem to be, have much function. If you look, if you put an evolutionary test to it and ask how much of the genome is conserved over evolutionary time, it's about 5%. So there's an additional 3. The exons are very conserved, so there's an additional 3.5% that's conserved. That means it uh, must have some function. We're not sure exactly what that function is. So there's still a lot to learn, but at least we have a list of the parts at this point. Now once the reference sequence was done, uh, <coughs> roughly 2003, uh, we said, OK, we've got one human reference sequence. But if we look around the room, we can see no two people are alike. So what we really need to, if we want to move forward, what we needed to do at that point was to understand something about the extent of genetic variation in our species. And so the genome, the people involved in the genome project turned their attention to enumerating human genetic variation. Uh, we knew early on that one human to the next is pretty similar. The current number is around 99.5 or 99.6 percent identical, one person in the room to the next person in the room. And some people said, wow, that's an extreme uh, degree of similarity. But if you think about it from an evolutionary point of view, Homo sapiens is a very young species, started from a very small number of founders. And so this is about the evolutionary spread, you would guess, over that period of time. And we're actually pretty close to our relatives. For example, in the coding sequence, we're between 70 and 90 percent identical with the mouse. And we're 98.5 percent identical with our closest living relative, the chimp. So uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, 0.4 percent of 3 billion bases is actually a pretty big number, right? So there's a lot of chance for difference, one person for the next. So the Genome Project turned to enumerating that <coughs> difference. And the first project was called the HapMap. 
which studied three populations of humans from around the world, Northern Europeans, West Africans, and Asians, trying to find all the common variation. That was followed on by the current project, which is called the Thousand Genome Project. And actually, the current goals of the Thousand Genome Project are to study about 2,500 individuals from about 50 populations around the world. And the idea is to catalog at least 90% of the variants that have a frequency somewhere in the world of at least 1% uh, amongst human populations. And in the coding sequence, that exome part of the genome, to cat catalog all variants that have a frequency of at least 0.1%. So in other words, when the 1,000 Genome Project gets done, we can look forward to having a pretty good handle on all variation that's common in the genome across our species in various places in the world. There's tons of rare variation that won't be detected by this strategy, so we'll continue to find the rare variation as we go forward. But at least we'll begin to have the common variation in our species. So what kind of variation is there? So there are several <coughs> categories, and I'm just going to briefly mention them and focus on two. First of all, there are small insertions and deletions. This would be like a few bases are inserted in one place. Uh, in the genome. And very often where they're inserted are, is some part of the genome that's non-functional, so it doesn't make any difference. Geneticists call these uh, insertions or deletions indels, and that makes up about 10% of the variation in sequence. There's some length polymorphisms. These tend to be sequences that are also short, maybe two nucleotides or three nucleotides repeated over and over again, typically in non-functional parts of the genome, but not always. That makes up about 5% of the variation. The variant that makes up a large chunk of the variant that I think you read about and heard, have heard about are single nucleotide polymorphisms, and I'll talk a little bit more about those. They make up about 40, 45 percent of the variation. And the other big variant, a kind of variation that we didn't really even anticipate in 2003, but we've learned about uh, since then, and we know that it counts for a lot of variation, are so-called copy number variants, and I'll show you what those are, and they make up about another 40 or 45 percent of the variation. So most of the variation is in these two, two categories, at least as far as we know, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, and copy number variants, or CNVs. Now, there's also variants where pieces of the genome, a, a chunk of the genome is broken at both ends and flipped around. That's called an inversion, and it can cause a problem if the breakpoints are in uh, protein coding genes. Those are hard to detect, and we don't really know the extent of inversions as a contribution of variation yet. We know certainly of some inversions that make a difference, but that's an area we need to learn a lot more about. Then, of course, at each generation, the chromosomes undergo recombination so that variants are reshuffled in terms of how they're distributed uh, from one uh, generation to the next. So there's a lot of genetic variation. Now, let me just emphasize, uh, make sure we're all on the same page in terms of understanding single nucleotide polymorphisms and copy number variants. So here's a typical single nucleotide polymorphism. There's, here's part of the sequence. G-A-T-C-A, -A, and at this particular place, this T, there's a second form of the gene, a different allele, uh, allele meaning a form of the gene. It's exactly the same here and here, but at this one position, it differs. And in this case, it, it's a T in the one form and a G in the other form. So it's a single nucleotide variant or polymorphism. Polymorphism means it's relatively frequent. And these single nucleotide polymorphisms occur about one in every thousand base pairs in the genome. Some areas, they're a little bit more common, and some areas, a little bit less common. But that's enough to give you about three million or so variants per haploid genome per individual. So that's a lot of variants to the extent that those variants occur, when those variants occur in key functional regions of the genome. Moreover, these variants, it's become very easy, the technology's been developed uh, to very easily and accurately measure at this position, let's say, whether the person has on one chromosome a T or a G, and whether they have a T or G on the other chromosome at that position. So that's called single nucleotide polymorphism or SNP genotyping, and we have uh, chips that do that, and the standard platform right now measures about a million SNPs across the genome. Uh, we have a big center over at Hopkins called the Center for Inherited Disease Research, and we do thousands of patients uh, this sort of genotyping per day, uh, measuring these variants. And so we use the SNPs as little tags to identify regions of the genome and how they've been transmitted down through the generations. So we'll come back to that in a minute. 
Um, now let me say a word about copy number variations. So here's two chromosome pairs. And so think of this as perhaps the chromosome that you inherited from your mother. And here's the corresponding chromosome that you inherited from your father. And in this region, there's a little deletion in this chromosome so that this piece of DNA that's meant to be here from your mother's chromosome is not there in the father's chromosome. Now it turned out that cytogenetics, looking at chromosomes in the microscope, has a resolution down to about 3 million base pairs, 3 megabases. That means a really good laboratory can see a change of a deletion or a duplication in a chromosome if that change is at least 3 megabases or bigger. And standard molecular techniques, of course, were gauged to find changes of the sequence of a few base pairs, one or two or three base pairs. So if we had been smart enough a few years ago, someone would have said, well, wait a minute. You're looking at the genome with two technologies, one that has a resolution down to about three megabases, and another that sort of is in the sweet spot of resolution is on the order of a single bases or a few bases. So you're not looking at a change that's in the size interval between those two technologies. And sure enough, it turns out that these copy number variations, here's the different kind of duplication in this region of the genome. So this chromosome is actually shorter by that amount that's duplicated. This chromosome is longer, be, uh, deleted, and this chromosome is longer because that region is duplicated. So it turns out that there's a lot of copy number variation in our genome. That means that in certain regions, if there happened to be a gene here in this little piece of DNA that's deleted off of this chromosome, then this individual, instead of having two copies of that gene, would just have one on this chromosome and would not have any copy of that gene on this chromosome. So that means that for uh, regions of the genome that are affected by copy number variation, the, we may have, instead of two copies of a gene, one copy. Or if it's a duplication, we may have three copies instead of two copies. So that makes a lot of uh, variation in the genome. It exposes genes that are sensitive to dosage. In other words, some genes, it's important that you have two functioning copies. Other genes, one is certainly adequate, so it's relatively insensitive to dosage. We don't really know how many genes are dosage sensitive, but we think maybe a few percent of genes are dosage sensitive. For deletions, the other thing, the other <coughs> way that this can be important from a medical point of view is that if you have some normal variation in a gene on this chromosome, if there's no deletion over here, that normal variation may not be very important because you have two copies of the gene. But if you have a CNV over here that deletes a copy of the gene, then you have some variation on this chromosome that normally is not too significant, it becomes more significant if that is the only copy of that gene that you have. So for deletions, it exposes otherwise normal variation on the remaining allele. And you can have fusion of genes where, you, where the junction, uh, the repair of the deletion occurs or the repair of the duplication occurs. So there's lots of ways in which copy number variation can perturb uh, genetic function. And not surprisingly, as we've appreciated this, we found that this is a rich source for producing uh, human disease. The bottom line of all this is uh, uh, there's a lot of variation in our genomes. In fact, in 2007, Science Magazine said that the breakthrough of the year was human genetic variation. And so we know that there are about 30 million single nucleotide polymorphisms in our species, about 3 million differences between each individual as compared to the reference sequence. And in terms of copy number variations, there's 3 to 7 large copy number variations per individual. About 5 to 10 percent of us have a copy number variation bigger than 100 kb. The average gene is 30 kb. And 1 to 2 percent of us in this room have a copy number variation bigger than a megabase could affect 10 or 20 genes. So there's lots of variation both at the single nucleotide level and at the copy number variation level. So in fact, uh, different members of our species are genetically uh, different even though we only differ on the order of one base pair per uh, thousand bases. Now, so there's a lot of uh, genetic variation. <coughs> now, <coughs> The last thing I want to say in this category is the sort of advances in technology, and I think many of you have heard about, and, but I use, just use this single slide to emphasize the rapid change in DNA sequencing technology that's gone on since 2003 when we said we'd finished the genome project. So down here are years, and this is 2000 over here, this is 2010 over here. Just pay attention to this red line, which is the cost per million high-quality base pairs of uh, uh, DNA sequence. So up here at the start of, uh, t at, in 2000, it was about $10,000 
per million base pairs. And you see the curve has come down so that in 2005 it was about 1,000, in 2006 it was about 100, in 2008 it was 10, and in 2010 it was $1. So the cost of DNA sequencing is coming down, 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 down very rapidly. And not shown in this slide, but perhaps you can get from the rate of accumulation of uh, sequence here, the ability, the throughput is actually going up and up and up. So the technology is advancing so that we can sequence DNA faster and faster and more and more accurately and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So DNA sequencing is becoming a very practical tool to enumerate the genetic variation that we just talked about to begin to understand the genetic differences between people. Consequently, we've begun to see uh, in the literature and in other places the availability of sequencing the DNA of s single individuals. So this li these little figures here uh, show that. And by the end of 2010, we had about 25 or 30 individuals whose whole genome sequence was available. And it's estimated that at the end of 2011, so we're one, one month away, there'll probably be on the order of 30,000 whole genome sequences of particular individuals available in various databases. So DNA sequencing and, uh, is really making a huge impact in enumerating uh, the genetic variation. Uh, what we have to learn is how to interpret all that. So that's all I'm going to say about the Genome Project, genetic sequence variation, and technology. And let's turn to uh, one, make one point on what I've called whole genome sequence biology. So it's interesting that, remember I said at the start of the genome project, uh, there was an argument about whether or not it would be useful and would it stimulate research and would we learn anything from it. And now, uh, some 20 years or so later from when those arguments were going on, any biologist who's studying any species wants to have the whole genome sequence of their favorite organism. So it's a complete flip in the mindset. And it's hard to keep track of. I sort of use this tree of life to keep track of it. Uh, we have whole genome sequences from eukaryotes, animals like ourselves, from bacteria, prokaryotes, and from members of the archaea, which is the third kingdom of life, which we only recently found out about. And it's really pretty hard to be sure, but I, th I think that we have certainly more than 2,500 organisms whose whole genome sequence has been obtained and deposited in various databases. So we've gone from arguing, is it useful, to now everybody's got to have it and use it for their favorite biology. And it's turned out to be a very uh, potent stimulus for understanding, the, uh, understanding biology. And the pace continues. The other thing that's important to realize is that the sequence that's used, the protein coding language, really holds true across all biology. So once you have a sequence of a, a eukaryote, you can use that sequence information to go look for the corresponding genes in organisms that are evolutionarily as far removed as bacteria. So the DNA sequence provides a language of biology that allows us to look at what particular genes do across all biology. And so we gain a huge amount of information by having that language, that universal language across all biology. Okay, now that's all I'm going to say about whole genome biology. Let's talk just for a minute about evolutionary thinking in medicine. Now, when I went to medical school, uh, evolution was not mentioned. I think the whole four years I was in medical school, I doubt that the word evolution was ever uttered. And if you asked me, and I was very interested in biology about evolution, I would immediately start thinking about dinosaurs and fossils and things that were pretty far removed from medicine. But uh, as Dobjansky said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I think now nothing in medicine will make sense except in the light of evolution. We are part of the biological kingdom. Uh, we uh, result the end products of evolutionary biology. So <clears throat> what do I mean by this? Well, if you start looking at how evolution works and then think about what it means for medicine, uh, for evolution, uh, a central theme is variation, and I've just showed you uh, that we're now focusing on human genetic variation, so centrality of variation in terms of how uh, things change over time. The continuity and consequences of natural selection, that is to say natural selection is going on all the time. We all partake of a little, uh, partake, partook of a little natural selection when we went outside and we had that very uh, great breakfast that was served up to us in terms of the caloric uh, increase, the kinds of nutrients that we exposed ourselves to, and so forth. So natural selection is going on all the time. 
Biological systems uh, have uh, developed mechanisms by which they respond to the environmental changes to evolve, and that's turned our focus to systems biology, putting organisms back together instead of using reduction, actually using an integrative approach to understand biology, uh, as shown here. And uh, an emphasis on individuality, because if you look at how selection works in whatever species you're thinking about, the selection actually occurs on individual members of a species. So that is what goes on in our species as well, and that selection, uh, which in other species we applaud because it, it serves to make wonderful biological characteristics in different species. And our species, the people who uh, come up on the short end of the stick for natural selection, are the patients that come to see you uh, with prob medical problems. So it's natural selection that's going on. In our species, we care about those individuals. In other species, we don't, we don't uh, worry about that. If you're interested in that, there's a review of this in PNAS in 2010 about evolutionary biology and medicine. So from a point of view of what we've learned from the genome uh, sequence in uh, evolutionary biology, it's really been very interesting because we can look and see how we compare with our closest living relatives at chimps. Remember I said we were 98.5 identical, so it's interesting to know how we differ, what makes us different from the chimps. We can even now uh, sequence our closest relative ever, which was Neanderthal. So now the genome of Neanderthal has been sequenced last year by uh, uh, Svanti Pabo and his colleagues. And you can ask, okay, what are the differences, the major differences between us and Neanderthal? And if you enumerate them and lump them together, it turns out there are a bunch of genes that show sequence variation between us and Neanderthal that are involved in energy metabolism. There's another bunch of genes that are expressed in the nervous system and are thought to be important in cognition. There's another bunch of genes, one that I'm particularly interested in, that uh, is inv are involved in neurodevelopment. And then the last category that's more that's particularly var variable are in microRNAs, these new RNA molecules that are important in regulation of gene expression. So you can begin to see the, get the idea of what is it that has changed over evolutionary time to allow Homo sapiens different properties and different characteristics as compared to uh, Neanderthal, our last, uh, living, our last relative. So that's evolutionary thinking in medicine. Let me just say a word now about disease gene identification. So uh, disease gene identification, if you look at when disease genes were first identified, uh, roughly uh, 1900, the time between 1900 and 1910, there was some uh, knowledge of color blindness before then, but we began to uh, think about genes causing specific human phenotypes in, in that first decade of the 20th century. But progress was very slow, and I plotted it here. This is a modification of a plot that originally was published by Joe Nadeau. Just look at this pink curve on this scale over here, and what I've plotted is uh, the identification of genes that are responsible for rare Mendelian conditions. So these are things like PKU, cystic fibrosis, Marfan syndrome, um, um, uh, um, LDL receptor defects, all of those strong phenotypes that are inherited as Mendelian traits just as exactly the way that Mendel showed in pea plants. And so you can see the number has gone up pretty dramatically and currently there are about 2,600 uh, genes in the human genome that have been shown to have variations that account for particular human diseases. <clears throat> We'll come back to the common complex traits later, but that's on a different scale you see here, so we're way behind on common complex traits. This is focused for a minute on the Mendelian disorders in this category. And <clears throat> you can actually look at the progress, and there's an online resource called Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man. This was started by Victor McCusick at Hopkins, and currently it's maintained by Dr. Otta Hamish and her team at Hopkins. And it currently lists, here I say 2,500, but the, today's count is around 2,650. And there's another online resource called Gene Test that measures the number of these genes that can actually be measured to make diagnoses or sequenced to be make, make diagnoses, and it's about 2,000 now. This plot, which was, came from an article by Art Baudet, can't read it, I guess, here, but this looks at the number of genetic tests going from 1990 up to the year 2000, and you can see this tremendous increase. So that here we had less than 
50 genetic tests. Now we have about 2,000 genetic tests. This is causing a radical change, particularly at least at Hopkins, for the way pathology deals with this. So a patient is seen and the doctor wants to send off a test for some very rare disorder and the pathology department has to find a laboratory that does the test and make sure that they're certified and so forth. So one of the things we're wrestling with is how to modernize the way we handle requests for genetic tests and how we interpret those results. Molecular cytogenetics, the copy number variations is moving along. So uh, we're making a lot of progress in this whole effort. Now, if you want to find out, uh, the one thing I want to point out though, that although this number is big, it's only about 15% of the total number of genes. So we have a lot of work left to do. There's no reason to think that the other 85% of genes won't also have Mendelian phenotypes associated with them. If you're interested in keeping track of this, I urge you to go to this catalog, on Deli Online Mendelian Inheritance of Man. I already mentioned it's very user friendly. You go to um, www.omim.org and uh, it has a search box here on the first page and you can punch in that search box uh, 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 either a disease name or a clinical uh, symptom. So here I've written in Marfan syndrome and I get a list of um, entries and, the, and the, those entries include fibrillin, that's the gene that's responsible for Marfan syndrome. Here's the clinical phenotype Marfan syndrome. So if we're in the clinic, we see a patient we think might have Marfan syndrome, we want to look up the clinical features. We put in Marfans, we click on this when we get it and we, I'll show you what you go to. Or if we want to learn something about the molecular biology, we put in Marfan syndrome, comes up with a gene, click on this and we go to the gene and so forth. These are other symptoms, other syndromes that are similar, have similar overlapping features that might be considered in the differential diagnosis. Uh, that's if you put in Marfan's. You could also put in not the name of the syndrome but just some clinical features. So here I put in uh, tall stature and dislocated ocular lenses and you'll see I get pretty much the same thing. The first thing that turns up is fibrillin. That's the gene responsible for Marfan syndrome. The third entry is Marfan syndrome. The second thing that comes up on the list is homocystinuria, which is a phenotype that is very similar to uh, Marfan syndrome. So you can use this as a tool for trying to figure out what your patient has based on the clinical findings that you observe. Uh, if you actually go to the entry, so here I've gone to the entry for Marfan syndrome. There's a, a long, long entry. I've just shown you the top of it, but it describes the history, the clinical features, and so forth. You have this table of contents over here, so if you're just interested in how to make the diagnosis, you pull that down, click on that, and it will tell you how to make the molecular diagnosis, where to send the test, and so forth. Or if you want to know uh, are there animal models and what do we learn from that? You just click on that. So it's a very useful tool. It's free and uh, very easy to uh, use. Just go to omim.org and, and try it out. Now what about identifying the genes, not for these rare Mendelian disorders, but identifying the genetic variants that contribute risk for common complex traits like diabetes that we already mentioned or coronary artery disease or neuropsychiatric disease. And there, notice that the scale is different and the progress has been very slow, although recently it has spiked up tremendously. So we now have variants that uh, we think are responsible or contribute risk for uh, at least 200 of these uh, phenotypes. By and large, these variants are not causative. They're actually susceptibility variants that either increase or decrease one's risk for a particular phenotype. And the method that's used for this is, I'm sure you've heard about, is called genome-wide association studies or GWAS studies. And these studies are agnostic approaches that identify SNP markers enriched as cases as compared to controls. So typically if you want to do this, you have a large group of cases and a large group of controls. And you do that SNP genotyping that I mentioned earlier across the whole genome. And you look for particular SNP genotypes that are enriched in your cases as compared to your controls. And it's agnostic in the sense that it makes no assumptions about what the genes are, what the variants are that are responsible. It, the only assumption it makes is that somewhere in the genome there's a variant that contributes risk for it. So it finds stuff that's not looking under the, li the light post, but looking across the whole genome without any sort of preconceived notions. It's a very powerful uh, aspect of this that's been very informative to us. And so you, you find markers, SNP markers, and then you look around those markers and you try to find the causative variants that are actually responsible for the change in susceptibility. And once you find those causative variants, that gives you a particular gene and tells you something about 
the biological perturbation of that gene function that increases the risk or decreases the risk for a particular trait. And it also gives you, to the extent that you know what the biological system that gene product works in, it identifies a biological system that is perturbed that gives you, uh, changes your risk for a particular disease of interest. So this agnostic approach has proved very powerful in terms of illuminating uh, biological systems that are responsible for certain phenotypes that we had no prior knowledge that they played a role in that. In the case of type 2 diabetes, years ago, we all thought that that was insulin resistance, that it was a peripheral problem, that the peripheral tissues were resistant to in insulin. There is some degree of that, but it turns out most of the variants that contribute risk for type 2 diabetes are in insulin production, not in insulin uh, resistance. So, and then, of course, understanding the pathophysiology gives us a better way of uh, treating, uh, of dealing with the patients. This is a sort of a diagram of how this might uh, happen. This is from a paper by Terry Manolio at the Genome Institute, and it is in this series, and I'll come to this at the end, in the New England Journal that Greg uh, is one of the editors for, Greg Fiero is one of the editors for, and it really is a wonderful collection of papers of sort of state-of-the-art genomic technologies. But this diagram, I don't know how well you can read it, but it shows uh, a region of the genome and maybe the distance between these two single nucleotide polymorphisms is 1 kb, and it shows it in three individuals. So you get the genotype of this SNP and the genotype of this SNP and these three individuals plus a whole bunch of individuals, and you look at the frequency of those genotypes in your cases and compare them to controls. And let's say in the cases, the particular variant is more common, and so you see more heterozygotes and more homozygotes for that variant. You might want to do a replication study, a different population, to make sure it's not something uh, uh, due to pop population stratification. In the end result, then, you plot out all of those variants and you ask, are there any variants that statistically are associated uh, with a statistically, at a statistically significant level with a particular disease phenotype. This has come to be called the Manhattan plot because it looks like the skylight, skyline of New York. Each chromo the, all the variants in each chromosome are color coded. And you see they're all more or less clumped around the bottom here, except in one region on chromosome 9, there's a bunch of variants whose p value is ex exceedingly uh, low, that is, here, P less than 10 to the minus 8. And so they're statistically significant even with all of the tests that one has done. So that says in this region of the genome defined by these two markers, there are some variant or some set of variants that contributes risk for this particular disease. So now we go look at that region very carefully, identify the causative variants, and move forward in our understanding of uh, uh, the biology of the disease. If you're interested in this, NHGR uh, maintains a great website. And here's the whole genome and all of the variants that have achieved statistical significance for all of the phenotypes. This was up to date as of March 2011. I think there's a newer version online now. The interesting thing is that many of these variants, as I've already uh, indicated, tag genes or biological systems that we did not previously know were important for particular uh, disease phenotypes. The other thing that we've noticed is that most of these variants for the common complex traits are not in protein coding space, not in those exons that we talked about, uh, which are usually hit for the Mendelian disorders, but are in fact in regions of the genome that seem to regulate gene expression. So you remember the little diagram of a gene I showed you, there were upstream sequences in the promoter or uh, more remotely related to the gene called enhancers, and we think that most of the variants that are involved in this uh, actually perturb gene regulation, so they're in the non-coding regulatory regions of the genome. That's important because we don't uh, know, we're, we're, we're more, uh, our, our, the state of the knowledge is weaker in terms of understanding regulatory variants as opposed to protein coding variants. So that's an important area of research going on right now. And in aggregate, if you look at a lot of disease phenotypes, we haven't found all of the variation yet. So much of the heritability, that is, the genetic variation that contributes to a phenotype remains to be explained. That has come to be called the dark matter. Uh, variants so far identified for particular complex traits may vary from as high as 60 percent, that's probably where we are for age-related macular degeneration, uh, to, as less, to less than 5 percent, that's probably where we are for type 2 diabetes. So for some disorders, we've only explained a small fraction of the genetic variation. For other disorders, the methods so far have allowed us to exp explain a, quite a substantial fraction of the genetic variation. So 
This comes to then, if we found variants, but they only explain a small fraction of the risk, people have said, well, what have you learned? Well, one thing you've learned is you've identified biological systems, and those systems become important to study to understand uh, the mechanisms of the disease uh, in a more, a more complete way. Uh, the other thing is that the risks that we calculate by present methods, I think, are, are uh, underestimates for a variety of reasons. So the common sort of uh, uh, critique of this is that the risk allele at this single nucleotide polymorphism confers a risk to individuals that is only 1.2 times greater, let's say, for example. So it's hard to change medical management. Or it's hard to get a person to change their lifestyle based on a tiny change in risk. So we have to do better than that. Now, remember that these risks are calculated in populations. They're not calculated in, in individuals. So for a given individual, a particular variant may be much riskier, or in fact, it may not be risky at all. We're just talking about the risk across populations. So we have to learn how to individualize these risks. And we have to recognize that the way these variants work are in complex biological systems. So this shows a complex biological system, each dot representing a protein product, and the interactions between these protein products uh, represented by the lines connecting the dots. So the systems are complicated and involve many components. So what we really need is not to look at a particular variant, but we need to learn how to look at sets of variants, uh, characteristic of a particular individual, and also integrate that with the environmental exposures of that individual to really calculate an individualized risk. And we just are not able to do that yet, although I must say that people are making considerable progress in developing new uh, uh, analytical methods. Uh, a more biologically based, I would say, a set of analytical methods to uh, really calculate uh, accurate individualized risks. And in fact, one strategy that's very recently been applied and is turning out to be much more uh, identifying much greater risks, actually, is looking not at the clinical phenotype, but looking at biochemical markers. So this has come to be called the metabolomics. And this is a study that was just published, looked at about 3,000 individuals, used a whole genome SNP genotyping that we've talked about, measured about 250 metabolites very precisely in these individuals, and found uh, 25 loci with effect sizes anywhere from 10 to 60 percent of explaining the biological variation for those small molecules. So it suggests that if we sharpen up the phenotype that we're looking at, in this case measuring a biological marker, the risks will be much more predictive and much, much more significant. So this is just the top of that list of all the variants, and you can see p-values here on the order of 10 to the minus 250. So these are highly statistically significant uh, variants that influence the level of these metabolites. The metabolites, in turn, <coughs> are involved in a variety of uh, complex traits. So we're making a good bit of progress in this area. I'm not going to say anything more about identifying variants for complex traits. And I just want to say a word about individual genome sequencing and then how uh, and what this means currently for pr the practice of medicine. So individual genome sequences, we've already mentioned that. The first one that was published was Craig Venters. Uh, and I think that's because part of his genome sequence was what his company sequenced uh, in, in the race to get a whole genome. So we had the reference sequence, but of course that was an anonymous person. So what you really want to know is what is the sequence of my patients. So that's why I think individualizing or obtaining the sequence of individuals really is a, really a change in the way we look at patients. So for example, inventors. Uh, he had 4.1 million variants as compared to the reference sequence. That included 3.2 million SNPs and about 300,000 copy number variants. There were 90 inversions. And the total number of space covered by the variants was about 123 megabases. That's a huge chunk, or about 12.3 megabases, a huge chunk of the genome. So to put it in personal terms, you could look at this individual and you could uh, look at his uh, lactase genotype and ask, you know, is he someone who can tolerate ice cream or not? You could look at his uh, DOPA DR4 receptor. That's associated with risk-taking behavior. And you probably could have made a guess about Craig Venter's uh, risk-taking behavior genotype before doing it, but you can actually make that measurement. Or you can look at his APOE genotype and understand his risk for whether or not uh, he has an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. So it's a completely uh, uh, different level of uh, information about individual patients.
So I think this will have all of these things, all of these changes and advances will have profound effects uh, for medicine. This is a picture of a Dr. Serrani who, who was rounding in Kansas in the middle of the 20th century. The picture was taken by Eugene Smith. This is sort of the idea that I had what I would be doing when I decided to go into medicine. Of course, it's far from, far from what we do. Uh, so we sort of have summed it up in terms of developing what might be called a science of the individual, how we're going to use this information to understand our individual patients. So what have we learned about the science of the individual currently? So first of all, it exposes the pitfalls of typological thinking. In other words, remember those kids I showed you where you say, okay, this is an example of a certain disease. Rather, we think this is a patient who has features of a particular disease and we understand that no two patients have exactly the same manifestations of that disease and no two patients will have the same responses to our attempts to uh, treat them. So it confirms what has in the past been called the physiologic view of disease. Each individual has their own disease. It emphasizes the importance of asking why does this particular patient have this particular problem at this particular time. So it uh, so turns the focus more on trying to understand why people get sick and what can we learn about from that uh, exercise in terms of managing the patients as we go forward in terms of the best treatment for this particular patient. However, moving it into medicine and making it practical and bringing it to the clinic and to your offices is a challenge and you all understand that. It's interesting to look at a paper that came out recently that attempted to do this. This is a scientist called Steve Quake. He had a relative who dropped dead of sudden cardiac death in, in his 20s. Here's a Quake over here. So he went to his cardiologist out of Stanford and he said, look, I have this relative who just dropped dead uh, in, their early, in, their, in their 20s and I want to know if I'm at risk for that. So that's a, a reasonable question to ask. So they got a big pedigree and they went ahead and sequenced his genome. And then they tried to use that information to give him a more informed understanding of his risks, uh, not only for sudden cardiac death, but for other uh, common uh, 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 medical problems. And uh, it turned out that was a really uh, daunting exercise. It took all of these people. Uh, here's Quake. He got to be an author on his own uh, sequence. Here's the person who led the study, Russ Altman, who's a cardiologist. There is um, one medical geneticist and one genetic counselor. It took the genetic counselor five and a half or six hours to sit down with Stephen Quake, who is a very uh, uh, accomplished molecular biologist, and explain to him all the variation that was found in his uh, genome. So you can imagine uh, doing that exercise to less sophisticated individuals. And in the end, at the current state, most of the information we could give him uh, was changing his risk for certain things in modest ways. So it did not really overnight change how uh, Quake would be managed and certainly did not change uh, much beyond uh, what we would have done from having his pedigree. On the other hand, uh, we're learning stuff about how to use this information as we go forward virtually every day. So I think going forward, we will increasingly learn how to use this information in a much more effective way. And I would support that argument uh, with, this, with these examples. First of all, to do this, it will require rig rigorous research of the kind the Genome Institute and, and uh, Hopkins is doing, both at, at the basic level, at the translational level, and at the clinical level. New technology continues to accelerate the pace. And it's not going to happen overnight. It happens gradually. And let me give you these three examples. First of all, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. When I was a house officer uh, in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia was the most common form of childhood leukemia and it had a 95% mortality rate, 95% mortality. Nowadays, acute lymphoblastic leukemia remains the most common uh, childhood leukemia. It has a 95% survival rate, 95% survival. So it went from 95% mortality to 95% survival. So what accounts for that change? So uh, actually, if you look at it, the medicines that are currently being used are very similar, if not identical, to the medicines that we used all those years ago. 
So it's not the kinds of medicines that are being used. What it is, I would argue, is that oncologists have learned that this diagnosis, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, is actually a heterogeneous group of disorders. And they've learned how to use gene expression profiling, agent onset, DNA sequence variation, and other tools to subdivide the patients. In other words, move from one collective diagnosis to subcategories of diagnosis, moving towards individualizing the diagnosis to individual patients, and then manipulating their treatment according to which subdivision the patient falls in. And that approach, a more informed approach in terms of differences between individual patients with the same diagnosis, has had a dramatic effect on uh, the consequences of having ALL. The same is true, but to a less effect for sickle cell disease. You all know that there are patients with sickle cell disease who are very sick from infancy forward. And uh, there are other patients that just have an occasional crisis maybe once a year or once every few years. So there's tremendous variation among individuals with sickle cell disease. And recall that they all have exactly the same genetic defect at the disease gene locus. They all have exactly the same mutation in beta globin. So what makes the difference between uh, one patient with sickle cell disease and the next? So increasingly, we're finding modifying genes that modify the phenotype of sickle cell disease. And we can define a subgroup of sicklers that are much common, uh, much more likely to develop, let's say, certain uh, a very disastrous side of uh, 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 complications of sickle cell disease, such as stroke and so forth. And we can manage that subset of patients with sickle cell disease much more aggressively when they're at risk for uh, developing a, a stroke, let's say. So we're individualizing uh, therapy for sickle cell disease, and that's having better outcomes. Recently, uh, uh, the genome project, uh, the genome scientists are sequencing tumors, so there's a lot going on now about sequencing individual cancers and the people who have the cancers. And one of the interesting things that's come out, first identified by Bert Vogelstein at Hopkins, looking at glioblastoma multiforme, the most uh, serious uh, brain cancer, and uh, it turns out that uh, a small fraction of uh, glioblastoma multiformes, had a mutation in isocitrate dehydrogenase. That's a gene encodes an enzyme in the citric acid cycle. But it turned out that you could stratify the patients about in terms of whether or not their tum tumor had an IDH1 uh, uh, mutation. And if you did that, it turns out that the patients with IDH1 mutations in their tumors behave differently than the patients that don't have those mutations. So we're moving again towards stratifying a different a diagnosis, moving to individualize the diagnosis and adjusting our treatment uh, and our thinking about the patients accordingly. So this is going on over and over again, and it'll go on rapidly in some areas and more slowly in other areas, and eventually we will uh, lead to a sort of a very individualized approach. Here's an example that I, I, I find sort of clever. This came from the DECO genetics in, in, uh, in Iceland, and they said if you look at baseline PSA levels, there's actually evidence that the genetic makeup plays a big effect on your PSA level. So currently, as you know, we use this standard cut point for PSA of 4. But if you look at uh, normal individuals, uh, 4 is actually, their PSA is actually a good bit below 4. And then uh, other in normal individuals have a PSA above 4. So this 4 is sort of an average cut point. So they argued that, let's say you measured genetic variation at six loci, they recommended, and then you adjusted the cut point for the individual based on their genetic makeup so that four would actually be too high for some individuals, and for other individuals, it's acceptable. So you individualize the risk of, that you determine with PSA level, and that gives you a more informed in, uh, a way to uh, deal with the, the patients. Now, time is short. I'm not going to say anything about pharmacogenetics except that it is a classic gene by environment interaction. The environmental variable in this case, though, is very well defined. You know the drug, you know the dose, you know when the patient started at it. And not surprisingly, there's a lot of genetic variation that influences response to drugs. So that's an area that's going to go forward very quickly, and it already has numerous positive effects. Time is short, and I won't talk about it, but variants that influence your response to statins or your uh, response to treatment for hepatitis C and so forth. And these variants tend to be variants of quite large effect. So that's an area where the variation really has turned out to be very important for the phenotype. The end result of all of this, I would argue, 
will get us to this point. So this is a picture, a painting by Sir Luke Fildes of the doctor looking at his patient. And this is what we would like to do. We would like to understand our patient. We'd like to look at that patient and not only use our history and our physical exam, but knowledge of the genetic makeup and the patient's environmental histories to really understand the patient in a level that is far better than what we currently can understand the patient. So uh, I think over the next few years, you'll see tremendous uh, progress in this uh, approach. Uh, so that we can think of our patients uh, not as representatives of a particular disease, but as individuals who have a particular set of problems. So with that, I'll close. Thanks for your attention. Let me give a plug to this uh, set of articles, which you can find in New England Journal of uh, Genom Genomic Medicine, an updated primer, and Greg is one of the editors. The one that came out this week is called Geno Genomics and Cardiovascular Disease, quite good. And I should also acknowledge my colleagues uh, and a heavy dose of Barton Childs, shown here, now deceased, who spent his whole life really thinking about how uh, we could incorporate genetic knowledge into making management of our patients more effective and more individualized. Thank you. Some realize that people probably have to get off the clinic or things. Uh, probably have time for a few questions. Have they ever sequenced a uh, embryonic stem cell? Does that completely represent a fully developed, or is that sequence early enough that you can modify at that early stage? Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, have people sequenced embryonic stem cells, and what are, what's different about that sequence as compared to, can yeah, can you manipulate it? So that touches on a whole area which I did not say a word about, which is epigenomics. So if you look at the sequence of an embryonic stem cell, let's say from um, a particular individual, and you could develop that cell line and then follow the individual over their lifetime, the sequence would remain the same, right? We were born with a sequence that was put together at the time of the sperm and the egg that made us uh, uh, form a, a, a uh, uh, fertilized egg. But what is different if you look at an embryonic stem cell versus cells in the adult is sort of what's called the epigenomic imprint. So this is the patterns of reg regulation of genes. So, it's easy to, I, the way I think of it is if you look at, let's say, the liver in an adult, when you have a liver cell and that liver cell divides, you get two liver cells. If you look at, a, 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 let's say, a, a, a muscle cell and that muscle cell divides, you get two muscle cells. And yet the genetic material in those two cells, the liver cell and the muscle cell, is the same. So what's different about those cells, and the reason one cell is a liver cell and one cell is a muscle cell, is that there are these programs of regulation of gene expression that are sort of turned on and turned off. And so in the liver, you turn on a program that's necessary for making liver cells. You turn off everything else. In the muscle, you turn on a program that's necessary for muscle cells and turn off everything else. Uh, that, those patterns or programs of regulation of gene expression are called epigenetics. And so what we would see in, a stem, in an embryonic stem cell is a much more um, non-committed uh, epigenetic set of regulations. And as the cell was differentiated into different cell types, the epigenetic patterning of the gene regulation of gene expression would become established to make the daughter cells that derive from that embryonic stem cell uh, uh, develop, uh, move them down the developmental pathway to the various uh, pluripotent outcomes that we would expect. When you go th to the next generation, all of that has to be erased because you start not with a collection of liver cells, muscle cells, and brain cells. You start with a single cell that then has to be pluripotent to become all other cells. In type 2 diabetes, you mentioned that the, uh, the peripheral, uh, regarding the insulin resistance, you said there is no problem in the periphery in the insulin itself, so there is no difference between type 1 and type 2. No, I didn't, say, I didn't say there was no problem, that you, you make a good point. What I meant to say, maybe I misspoke myself, but what I meant to say is there certainly is an element of insulin resistance, but it turns out that equally important, if not more important, in type 2 diabetes are various aspects of insulin production. So type 2 diabetes is different from type 1 diabetes, which is a more pure or, uh, you know, drop out of the beta cell, so basically. So insulin insufficiency and the paper. Correct. Yeah, thanks.
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the question is, where is the limit of this curve uh, that has to do with the cost and throughput of DNA sequencing? And I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure we haven't reached. We're not even close to the limit. So you know that uh, some years ago, Francis uh, set the audacious goal of a $1,000 genome. And certainly, <clears throat> we can do uh, a whole genome. Uh, you can order a whole genome on a patient, let's say, uh, at Hopkins for about $4,000 right now. So that's pretty darn close to the $1,000 genome. Uh, you can do a whole exome, that is just look at the exons, for about $1,000. Now. Uh, However, that gives you sort of a preliminary set of analysis of that sequence. It does not give you a sophisticated analysis of that sequence. And currently, uh, in fact, there was an article in the New York Times yesterday uh, pointing out that the really expensive part of genome sequencing, particularly as what we're interested in, how does it, what does it mean for our patients, is in the analysis. And that is coming along at a s slower pace, and so the if you, want, if you have to factor in how much does it cost to pay the people to do the analysis and so forth, it's more expensive. Now, but there are new technologies available compared to the way we, the current next generation. There's already a next, next generation that's clearly coming down the pike, and that will clearly lower the cost and, and increase the throughput more. So, uh, you know, I, I think the 1,000 genome will easily be surpassed in the near future. And what I tell uh, patients and medical students is, of course, you know, if you come to Johns Hopkins, I don't know how it is here at Suburban, but if you have some complicated problem, you come to Johns Hopkins at 9 o'clock in the morning, you go home in the afternoon, you're going to blow $1,000, uh, you know, very fast. So it's in, the, it's in the range of everything. I mean, you may, may not even be able to get out of the parking lot for that, but I don't know. Yes? Point of interest. Yeah. How close was the Neanderthal genome to Homo sapiens? <coughs> the question is, <coughs> so the question is, how close was the uh, Neanderthal genome to Homo sapiens, and would they be interfertile? So uh, it's about 99. Uh, f first of all, the, the sequence quality of the Neanderthal is nowhere near the sequence quality we have for Homo sapiens. But the best guess, I think, is it's about 99. Uh, 99 percent, a little bit better than 99 point cent, 99 percent identical. And uh, if, uh, people were very interested to know if Homo sapiens, for some reason, I don't, actually I don't know why we're so interested to know, but people are interested to know whether there was any interbreeding between Homo sapiens and Neanderthal. And the genetic evidence that we have right now suggests yes, there was interbreeding between Neanderthal and Homo sapiens. And uh, you know, we cohabitated, and it seems to me that pretty likely. I, that's where I would have bet before we had the genetic evidence. <laughs> Human nature being what it is. <laughs>